toys have to be managed quite properly. And uh, yes, I'm ambidextric. I use both hands equally. In fact, I'm a lefty. My father beat me so much when I was a kid, I had to develop the right hand habits. I had no choice. So it was uh, kind of developed. And uh, yes, I've got photographic memory. I say it's very minor. I can actually memorize the whole Quran in a week. I've proven that before. Um, unfortunately, I was never able to understand anything. Even my most favorite theory, Newton's theories of motion, I could never understand them. I could read them and memorize them, but then I had my three years younger sister who have to always explain them to me. What do they mean? So it is a curse, I can tell you that. Um, uh, and yes, um, uh, at much younger age, I did go and try to get myself into cages and get beaten up so badly I decided to go back to science. It wasn't very good. Um, uh, that was just for fun, for a little bit of fun. So, and uh, Jamal always mentioned that fact because he always said, if he ever meets me on the cage, he will beat me up. So I quit because of that. So, as you can see, no props, no PowerPoints, nothing. Got my iPad, and sorry to Sony, I wish I actually took my Samsung uh, <laughs> notepad because I do have one. <laughs> but uh, I forgot that the sponsors are uh, uh, Samsung, so my apologies to that. <laughs> my topic is past, present, future. World changes and ever-increasing pitfalls of innovation, entrepreneurship, and the relation therein. So what am I doing here? I'm trying to use innovation and entrepreneurship as derivative of creativity. And I'm not sure if everybody's going to agree to that because I already had a lot of arguments, as I told you. It starts from home. I'm the dumbest one in my house. And everybody thinks they're much smarter than I am. And everything I say, they have to challenge it. So I hope I don't have the same. Uh, I'm not going to get the same from here now. So, <laughs> and I do mean it. All my brothers and sisters really do believe that I'm really, really dumb. So I hope I can share anything <laughs> onto, onto this stage. So as I said, first, I would like to make sure that this session, that I'm running, the 18, 20 minutes that I have, are not only informative, but also educative. So people can leave here with tangible experience and tangible knowledge to go back and get this concept of creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship back in love. So, as I said, nothing comes easy. Or um, uh, Jamal has already expressed that. Not only we have passion, wanting to become innovators. And here, I'm putting my innovation or innovator's hat right from the start, or researchers. It's very hard work and a lot of dedication and no giving up, as I told you. By the way, I did actually fight in the cages. I worked as a security guard, and I worked in McDonald's when I was in Europe, so I can pay for my education. That was means to an end. I had to get there. So it was not easy. It was never presented to me on a silver platter and say, well, you are a scientist from now on, or you are an innovator, go back and create patents. It was very, very difficult work. And this has led me to end up being recognized by NASA. So I worked for NASA for almost two years on various projects. And I worked with very, very good people. And as I said, I'd like to share the experience, not only my personal experience, but also to the people that I worked with. I actually worked, and this is a very honest speaking, on, with a team that people who are much better than me, by far. I had come from my university, being the golden boy, and I couldn't even fathom. When I got to NASA, they actually told me, stick to mathematics, because you are dumb in everything else. Yeah? So they put me back on the physics department and mathematics, because there were people like Martin Sehurst, Martin Sehuris, Maria Sehuris, and uh, Sean Wolf, who were heading the, 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 those uh, um, NASA labs. And these guys had calculators in their heads. And there's no mathematical formulas that they can solve by just thinking. We have to write down and sketch everywhere. And apparently, I've destroyed all the NASA Labs uh, walls with my uh, jotting down uh, ideas. So let's get back to inter innovation and entrepreneurship first. OK? So first, innovation. What is innovation? What is innovation? OK? It's a concept of bringing a new idea to life, and then commercializing it, OK? So there's a big argument. We have this argument almost on a regular basis. And unfortunately for me, I actually run the Industrial Innovation Center. So the argument is 
does innovation require a basic research or not? I argue not. So I know uh, I can see a lot of people here catching my neck as soon as I get out of here. But I think uh, innovation could be a spark of an idea that people are willing to put together. However, let's make sure that we do not confuse innovation and entrepreneurship. Because innovation is changing a process, service, or a product. And entrepreneurship is introducing a new product or into the market, or rather, not really necessarily new product. My best example of innovation is Pizza Hut in Oman. Not Pizza Hut in US when it started. In Oman. Because these guys, the guy who thought of Pizza Hut must have been a genius. He's the best entrepreneur I can give an example. And I'm sorry to everybody else in case uh, people don't like the guy because I don't know who it is. Yeah? So <laughs> the idea here is this. This guy came in 19, late 1980s or early 1990s where shawarma was the king in this place. It was 50 beza for shawarma. This guy went to America and came back and said, I can introduce pizza and sell it to three reals and they'll bite. Now that's a big, a big challenge, a big risk. So there we go where entrepreneurship kick in. This guy is a proper entrepreneur. He said, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to open a pizza hut and it will work. Apparently, since I keep on saying this everywhere I go, I've been told that pizza hut has struggled at the beginning. That even proves more that this guy was an entrepreneur. Because what, what I've been told is this. Because pizza hut struggled at the beginning, then this guy's not an entrepreneur. It's just a trial and error, normal businessman. I said, no. The harder he tried and persist he's the more of entrepreneur. Going back to the idea that nothing comes easy, so neither to the entrepreneur, nor to the innovator, or to the basic researcher. So, what is the, what is the, how do we become innovators? What is the concept of innovation? I'm going to try and run this as slow as I can because I want to reach my 20 minutes, but I'm about to finish. Don't worry about it. I'll get it. I'll get it. We'll get there. So, what are the pitfalls of innovation? What are the pitfalls of creativity? And I'm talking about personal experience sitting at the Industrial Innovation Center. We've got two major pitfalls from, what, from our observation here. And this is what I said. I'd like this to be pretty educative. And this is the part where education kicks in. First, as Jamal has mentioned earlier on, we've got a syndrome, actually a disease. And I'm trying to publish a paper to actually Put, make sure that that is put as a disease. I call it, he stole my idea disease. It's a disease. So everybody comes in. I'll give you an example, and, and, and I'm sorry if this the, I mean, is related to you, whoever the individual, because this is a fantastic example. Somebody came to me and said, I've got an innovation idea. I said, okay, tell it to me. He says, no, I can't tell it to you, because it's a secret. And I said, okay, why are you in my office then? Do you want to talk about football? Because I like football, yeah? yeah? He says, no, 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 no. I'd like to talk about my innovation idea. Yes, but what do you want? He says, it's secretive, but I trust you, so I'll tell it to you. I said, okay, fantastic. Let's sit down in my office. We'll go to the meeting room where we lock ourselves in so nobody can hear. And I'll sign an NDA with you so that I, don't, I make sure I don't, I don't give it out. It's innovation, right? He said, yes, it's innovation. I took him to the office. We got there and he told me, my idea is opening a factory that will recycle tires. And I said, that's the best innovation I've heard since I came here, if it's considered to be innovation. Because car recycling tires, first of all, already exist. And I told him, you're the 1,000th person, person who come to me and tell me that you want to do that. And that is not entrepreneurship. I'm not, sorry, not innovation. And I'm not even sure if it's an entrepreneurship. Because what do you want? So you can imagine... This is one of the very small examples we get a lot, where people come with their ideas and they don't want to, tell, to share them because they might be stolen. Funny enough, I'd like to give myself a big head now. I've developed 32 patents. I've got more patents than the whole Middle East put together, believe it or not. So if you count the patents that are developed in the Middle East, I've got 32. Middle East are only being credited with eight patents, believe it or not. And I think now it's about 15 or 16. As the countries, yeah? And believe it or not, none of the patents belong to me. They hold my name as a developer of the patents in UK, in America, in Germany, in France. But they belong to a company. And I didn't care. My aim was 
I want to be the guy who developed the patent. That's my passion. My passion is to do research and innovation. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's said very much. It's very, very difficult, and I'm sure my fellow innovators who are going to come on the, on, onto the stage will explain this. It is said often that if you are an innovator, often you are not, or a researcher rather, you're not a businessman. So you can die with your ideas, and often they come much, much years later, somebody else will use them. And me, I refuse to fall into that category where I develop ideas, and they are used after 100 years of my death. I want them to be used today so I can see them on the market. Okay? So, another thing is, so, as I said, going back to this, another thing that gave myself a, a big head, I was, I'm a very good friend of Sage, the guy who developed Google, believe it or not, yeah? So, <laughs> he's a friend of mine. In fact, we went to, we, were, <laughs> we started research, one of the small research together with a guy called Folusho. I hope he gets a video of this because he would, he would get to remember that I still remember him. And we had first come with a concept called Crystal Clear. Before Google, believe it or not. And this is documented even on the internet. So you can have a look at it. Okay, it's called Crystal Clear. I'll explain the concept just before we get to the end because this gets to my personal research. But let's get back to the second pitfall now. Okay? Every time people come to my, to my, to my office, this is what I do. Geez, this violates the laws of, of physics. This violates the basic science. What's going on? I get somebody who came to me a few weeks ago and he told me, check this out. I have attained cold fusion. I said, that's fantastic. Can I be your best friend? Because I know you'll become a billionaire, a trillionaire actually. You'll become the first trillionaire in the world. Can I be your best friend? What did you do with the cold fusion? He says, no. I can cool water, hot water, by insulating a pipe. That's not cold fusion. So, First of all, this is the most important part. The message I'm trying to address here is this. If you're going to come and you want help to get your innovation in the market, or if you want to get your idea into the market, make sure you do two very important things. One, make sure it does not violate the basic law of physics or science. And if it does, publish a paper first, whereas the scientific community will agree to it. So if you're going to tell me today that you've got a way of violating the laws of perpetual motion, come back to me first and tell me this is a scientific proof first that I can violate the laws of perpetual motion. If you're going to tell me you've attained cold fusion, come up with an experimental proof that, look, I can actually attain cold fusion because as we already know, those are two, the reason why I'm using those two ideas is because those are the two most controversial issues in science today. There's a big argument, I don't know if anybody knows Ross here, the, the Italian scientist who, is, who claims to have achieved the cold fusion. By the way, if anybody doesn't know what is cold fusion, cold fusion it means using very little energy to attain much more energy. Okay? So you can cool water or heat water or rather spin the world on the other way around if you like. If it's going to the left, if the orbiting of the world is going to the left, you can actually have the enough power to actually force it to orbit the other way around. So count back the days. And Ross is saying, he, ideal condition, he can produce that. Guess what? We're talking about Ross with a team of scientists, about 20, 30, very renowned, very respected scientists of the world. So how many did I say? Ross and about 20, right? And the rest of the scientists community, they're all opposing them. So if you're going to come from home on the kitchen research and telling me you're going to violate that or you're going to join their group, come back with very, very, very good evidence. Otherwise, there's no point of me wasting my time entertaining you. So this is the situation where we have we have to make sure that if we're building ideas and these ideas are violating... Here, yet again, maybe one thing to make, to, make very, to, to make clear and very important. Passion is important. And trying is very good. Listening to the scientists is even better than the two. Okay? So if you come and you're told, look, forget about the law of perpetual motion. It's, it's a little bit of a problem here. Let's try and work on this a little bit, little bit controlled direction where we can attain something to start with. It'll give you more motivation by seeing physical results. So it's always good to get there. And I know this topic is controversial, and I'd like uh, the, the people who are coming back to the stage here to try to challenge it and put me on the spot. It's all good. So the problem, as I said, there are two. So we've got, he stole my idea syndrome, and I don't care about the basic science. Okay? I can make, uh, I can... I can attain the speed of light without needing to, to worry about science. It's just going to come because I dream of it. These are the two problems that we're having, and this needs to be taken care of. 
So, now, example of the development. So I'm, going, I'm getting back to my main topic because I realize I've got about three minutes left. I'm getting back to the main, to the main topic. Past, present, and future. And I'm going to come with an example so that I can get back to my crystal clear project to you guys. Past. I'm going to use IT as an example because then I'm sure most of us here have used computers. So it's easier for, for you to understand what I'm saying. Past, if you remember the Lycos and the Alta Vista engines when it comes to such engine, they were complicated when you were looking for information, they were driving you nuts. Most of the people were giving up on, uh, on, on, on computers on, and internet search because of the, pro the, the complexity that was related to doing your search with those engines. That's past. Nobody uses those engines anymore. Now we've got the present, Google. Google is fantastic. We've got the page theory. By the way, I don't know page at all. It's not my friend. Okay? So <laughs> I know Sergey. Anybody doesn't know, the founders of Google are Sergey and Page. I know Sergey really well. He happened to be my age. And Page is a kid. A multi-billionaire kid. Yeah, but he's a kid, though, to me. Okay? <laughs> so, so he's, uh, um, he is the one who developed the concept that is called page ranking. Not page ranking, ranking pages, but page because of his name. And it's the most sought-after formula in terms of sorting out your searches. And Google became phenomenal. It's worth how much? Maybe I'm not 100% if I'm accurate. Maybe I'm well below the ballpark, but I think it's 400 billion, if I'm not wrong. Maybe a little bit more. Yeah, not less. That's how much Google is worth because of that formula. And the future, what we think, is the research that we've been doing for the last, well before Google. Okay? And now we think maybe it's, it's working properly. Yet again, by the way, so nobody comes to me outside and trying to become my friend because they think I'm a billionaire. Oh, I'm going to become a billionaire. I get nothing out of this. I get nothing out of this. I'm just a researcher who's developing a patent that is paid for. So the future is the crystal clear engine. Why, we call it, why is it called crystal clear engine? It allows you to see everything that is in the internet. What does it do? In a very short time, I'm going to try to use a minute to get this done. <clears throat> it tries to create mini you. So what it does, it learns your behavior as you're using computer. So as soon as you introduce it to your computer, it learns everything that is available in your computer. And by the way, this is the magic. Or oh, this is my magic. I should be proud of that. It's not, I don't use neural network. We don't use any of those known sophisticated mathematical or mathematical based formulas to create the artificial intelligent brain. We're using basic intelligent agents that have three behavior, which is react, learn, and act. Okay? Or as we call it, BDI, behavior, desire, and intention mechanism that they have in their head. And what they do, they gather what is on the computer first and learn about the content of the computer. So make sure that you don't have anything to do with terrorism inside of it. Otherwise, your, your, your agent will become a terrorist. Be careful. Okay? <laughs> so, anyway, so we call it an intelligent agent that mimics you. What does it do? It gets into your computer, learn everything, and then start learning your behavior is the way you're interacting with it. It learns. It asks you questions. Just like your child. So if you teach it, whatever you're doing, ask questions, and it grows like a baby. Except we're trying to accelerate the years, and we're trying to make sure that in within a year or two, it's a matured child mimicking your brain. And what does it do? And this is the key point. It makes you present all the time on the internet. So, what happens if I want to know about Brandon Mann, for example? My agent, Abdullah is called, he wants to know about Brandon Mann. Instead of going to Google and type about Brandon Mann and I get all these uh, sophisticated yet inefficient page formula that will rank all everything that says Brandon Mann or Mann brand and everything else, okay? It actually go to the avatar, as we call it, or the agent that belonged to Said Faisal or Ibu Saidi, and say, ah, these are the avatars that know most about this idea. And they'll go to them and say, I want to know about this. And they will gain direct information from the host's mouth, as we call it, and bring it back to the, the user. And even more important point here is it will go back. Every day when I arrive, he knows my behavior. He knows I like, by the way, I'm a big enthusiast of quantum physics, okay? And he knows my agent will know about me because it'll be mini me. And my agent will try to sustain, and this is where the balance comes mathematically, to make sure that the information it knows, I know, and the information I know, it knows. So anything, and it will be, of course, it will become an enthusiast of quantum physics, just like me. 
anything new about quantum physics on the internet or with other agents that he knows they're enthusiastic about quantum physics, you'll share with him. And my agent, as soon as I arrive back in my computer, he'll tell me, look, did you know about this new fact about quantum physics? So now what do we get? A recipro reciprocative search engine. An engine that can actually talk to you. So it is actually smart. Google is not smart. You always have to put keywords, the searches, and it comes back with as much junk as it can and it bring it back to you as much as it can match the ideas. So this is, I personally think, is the future. My, this was derived from my research. This is just to close down so that people can know a little bit of my background. Um, my previous research was with Kevin Warwick. Anybody knows Kevin Warwick here? We need to raise our hands really quickly because I don't have time anymore. Soon Jamal will kick me out of the stage. Um, Kevin Warwick is the guy who built telekinesis communication. It, is, it does exist and it's there. So let's don't argue about that. It's actually been tested. So I get a microchip in my body and one of you guys get microchip in your body and you can hear my thoughts. It actually exists. So there's research on the internet. You can check it up. So this is <laughs> telekinesis. That's the research I was involved that inspired most of my work. The next research we're trying to do, which is maybe Dr. Adra can have a, a good go at me on this, or maybe can collaborate with me now. We're trying to create electromagnetic. Um, everything, going back to quantum physics, is based on electrons, which are either positive or negative, and we believe all chemicals can be mapped electronically. And I'm trying, or with a team, we're trying to build a chip that if it goes into your body, you should never get sick. It'll take a very long time for me to explain to you the actual concept. You might have to come to my lab. But I, th that's the concept. We're trying to make people not getting, rather than sick, but weak, okay? And this goes back with our passion. At the moment, we're trying to build, the current research that I'm doing is I'm trying to build a bone density scale for the Middle East. At the moment, every Middle Eastern, believe it or not, is either osteoporotic or osteopenic, which means they're sick. Yeah, all of us are sick. But we don't break our bones. So that came my idea. How could we all be sick, but osteoporotic or osteopenic breaks their bone at least once a year if you're osteopenic? And we don't break our bones, yet they're rate, rating us osteopenic. Then I came to the realization that the scale we're using to measure our bone density is the same as the Germans. They're 10 times our size, not twice. <laughs> How could it be the same? So now we're trying to build our own, our own scale. I'll leave you to that. So anybody wants to talk to me, you can always see me. Salam alaikum. <laughs>